Physicists have been looking for a theory of everything for a century. Einstein already tried his hands at it and failed, and so did thousands others after him. If you follow the popular science news, you'll see a new theory of everything popping up every couple of weeks, and then you never hear of them again. I've done a lot of videos in which I look at those new theories because you never know, maybe one of them is the real deal. But today I want to go through the main reasons for why I think that these theories all fail and what I think is the most promising approach. The first reason these theories of everything all fail is that they're not actually theories of everything. A theory of everything, if you remember, is one that combines the four fundamental interactions – electromagnetism, the strong and weak nuclear interactions, and gravity – in one framework. The first three of those are quantum theories, gravity is not. The problem with these theories of everything is that they don't include the quantum part in its entirety. What I mean is that they do not include the measurement process in quantum physics. None of them does. And what's a theory of everything that doesn't explain how a measurement works? How is that everything? Let me be concrete. A measurement is done by a detector, and a detector is made of particles, which are in the standard model. So a theory of everything really should explain it. But none of the theories of everything I have seen does that. They don't explain the measurement process, certainly not string theory. Why is anyone even surprised that it doesn't work? The second reason is that a theory of everything isn't necessary. What I mean is that there is a discrepancy between the standard model and general relativity because the standard model has quantum properties, whereas general relativity doesn't. All right, but resolving this does not require one common framework. Loop quantum gravity, or asymptotically safe gravity, for example, resolve this tension by giving quantum properties to gravity, but without also merging gravity with the standard model in a common framework. The reason this matters is that because a common framework for a theory of everything is not mathematically necessary, one doesn't know what mathematical assumptions to make. This brings in a lot of ambiguity that physicists fill in with guesswork. This is the problem, for example, with Gerrit Lisi's E8 or Eric Weinstein's geometric unity. They make extra assumptions because they particularly like one or the other mathematical structure. But why this structure? Why not some other? And all of this guesswork makes failure near certain. The third reason is that the theory of everything might not be a final theory, yet everyone assumes that this is so. What I mean is that they all assume that a theory that combines the standard model with general relativity should itself not leave any open questions. It must work at all energies. There is nothing more below this theory of everything. It's the final piece in the puzzle or nail in the coffin, whatever your perspective. I'd say that the theory is also final and complete as an additional assumption, and maybe it's assuming too much. Why not turn back on the ambition and just combine the standard model with gravity? Maybe that combination isn't a final theory. Maybe there is another deeper layer below it. The fourth and final reason is that the theory of everything might not live up to the current fashionable requirements of beauty and simplicity, yet these are frequently used in their construction. One of the examples of this I've already talked about previously, it's a mathematical assumption called naturalness. But the theory of everything might just not be natural in this sense. So if you assume that it must be, 
you'll not find what you're looking for. There are other such requirements. For example, a lot of approaches to a theory of everything start from symmetries. There are historical precedents for this, of course. Symmetries have worked great for the standard model, but maybe it's time to ask where the symmetries come from. Maybe the symmetries themselves emerge from something else that theory which explains everything. If I listen to myself, which I sometimes try but rarely enjoy, then this brings me to the somewhat odd conclusion that the most promising approach to a theory of everything that we have is Penrose's idea of gravitationally induced collapse. Because, you see, first of all, it's actually taking the measurement problem seriously. Second, it does include both gravity and quantum theory. And while Penrose never looked at this, I'm sure that this measurement process would also work for the standard model. Third, Penrose doesn't make any final theory claim. And fourth, he doesn't make any extra assumptions, no new symmetries, no supposedly natural constants. Wasn't Penrose's model recently experimentally falsified? No, actually not. What was experimentally ruled out is what's been called the penrose diossi model. But I'm not sure why this even has Penrose's name attached to it. The penrose diossi model is clearly non-local and not generally covariant, so I'm not surprised it's trouble. Don't get me wrong, it's great that it's been tested and great that it's been ruled out so that we can move on, but Penrose's idea doesn't work like this. I hope that if you've been wondering what's going on with physicists and their theories of everything, this gives you an impression for what's going wrong. If you're working on your own theory of everything, I hope this gives you some inspiration. And if this video inspired you to get started on your own theory of everything, I recommend you check out the physics and maths courses on Brilliant. Brilliant offers courses on a large variety of topics in science, computer science and mathematics. All their courses have interactive visualizations and come with follow-up questions. Whether you want to learn to think like an engineer, brush up your knowledge of algebra or want to learn coding in Python, Brilliant has you covered. It's a fast and easy way to learn and you can do it whenever and wherever you have the time. And they're adding new courses each month. I even have my own course on Brilliant. That's an introduction to quantum mechanics. It'll help you understand what a wave function is and what the difference is between superpositions and entanglement. It also covers interference, the uncertainty principle and Bell's theorem. And after that, you can continue maybe with a course on quantum computing or differential equations. This doesn't just sound good, it is good. If you go and check out Brilliant, make sure to use my link brilliant.org slash Sabine or scan the QR code. You'll get to try out everything Brilliant has to offer for a full 30 days and you'll get 20% off the annual premium subscription. So go and check this out. I can really recommend it. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.